All righty, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you are doing well. The market's starting to slow down a little bit, so you know what that means. Take your hands off the keyboard, grab that coffee cup, and perk those ears up. I got the man, the myth, the legend, Adam Serhan here. Adam, first things first, you said you were traveling. I got a question for you. How are the airports looking right now? Are they super crowded, or are they kind of laxed out? What do you think so far as far as air travel? You know, Kareen, it's one of those situations where everyone was expecting the market to have slow down. The economy would slow down. You'd have that soft landing, hard landing. That was the big debate for most of last year. From my anecdotal evidence, and that's Disney World in Orlando for Christmas and traveling since and before and after, places are packed, packed. So the whole notion of a soft landing and or a hard landing, that even debate, I don't even think it's going to be one of those two. I don't even think it's going to be a landing whatsoever. The economy is humming. And so far, it's looking really, really strong. The anecdotal evidence, the, the malls are busy. I, I mean, I can tell you, Disney World was literally sold out. You couldn't even go during Christmas. That doesn't happen during market bottoms. That doesn't happen during recessions. That doesn't happen when things are bad. You know, we're beginning now to see layoffs. We're beginning to see a little bit of potential slowdown down the road. But really, this economy is, has defied all the odds. Everyone expected a much bigger decline in, in economic activity. And that just hasn't happened yet. You know, I, I'd like to touch on with you a little bit here on the psychology of not just Wall Street, but Main Street as well. We're starting to see now to where most people have less than 2% in savings. Overall, consumer credit is on, on a broad spectrum, sky high there. But short-term lending, as far as like the pay-as-you-go style things there, seem to, to be down overall. Do you think Main Street itself and Wall Street itself is starting to realize, okay, we now understand the environment that we're in, and they're kind of off of that, I'll say, uh, bull market bliss. And now they go, okay, we're we're kind of back to 2018 levels here. We need to start thinking about innovation, or am I off tilt with that? Do you think it's still going to be a rough little bit moving into the spring of 23 here? So the, it's one of the biggest questions that the trillion dollar question is what happens to the market this year, right? I think I think you're right on point here that the market's facing, it's always a forward-looking mechanism, right? So if you look for the one of the biggest reasons why people just miss the market, they don't understand it, is because they're constantly looking backwards. Economic data comes out, tells you what happened in rear view mirror. The earnings, we're in earnings season now, comes out, tells you what happened last quarter. But the market's looking forward. And I talk about that in my book, in Psychological Analysis, um, where think about driving a car. You have a windshield, which is this big. You've got the rear view mirror that big. So it's for a reason. You pull out of your driveway, you look backwards. But once you get out of the driveway, you got to look forward. If you keep looking backwards, you're going to crash. So the Fed told us their biggest problem in life is inflation. Well, OK, they're going to raise rates to combat inflation. They've been doing that. Well, OK, inflation began to come down over the last few months. So we saw CPI specifically in October, uh, CPI, then November CPI. And every time the CPI came out since then, you saw the market really take off and explode higher with the expectation that the Fed's not going to have to raise rates as aggressively going forward. However, and this is a big thing here, if there is no soft landing and or hard landing, meaning Main Street doesn't feel the pain, consumers are going to continue to spend. And if consumer if demand remains strong, well, guess what? prices are going to remain elevated. And that's a problem for the Fed. So the Fed, the notion on Wall Street that the Fed's going to pause and then pivot. Pause meaning they're going to stop raising rates and then pivot, they're going to start cutting rates. That's predicated on the fact that we have an economic slowdown. Well, if there is no economic slowdown or barely a recession or a very mild one, guess what? That whole thesis might have to get thrown out the window and we might have a situation where the Fed may be having to continue to raise rates for longer than initially expected, or they could pause and then start raising again. Eventually, the economy has to cool off or slow down for inflation to come down because Economics 101 tells us what? Price is a function of supply and demand. So if you've got supply pretty much steady, but demand remains strong, what's going to happen to price? It's going to stay elevated. And the Fed needs the prices to come down. And that their primary focus right now is for inflation to come down. You know, and, and that brings a question overall on this. Do you believe that the metric that they're using is too long? Because we've always stated beforehand that it's about a six month lag on that. Because of now, we're in a much faster paced environment 
overall. <laughs> Do you think we need to start looking at three month data or even one month data? Because yes, we're still looking back, but looking back six miles versus looking back three miles may give the Fed and other market analysis, economic analysis, a better idea of right now. And even for the market itself to go, okay, well, this isn't a compilation of three months worth of data. I don't care what my employees did six months ago. I want to know what's what's my update for three months. I mean, let's be honest. We we have quarterly updates, quarterly earnings. We don't have, you know, two-year earnings periods here. So what are your thoughts on the duration of time for the data that's being looked at? Yeah, I think it's a really good point. I, what they say and what they do is different. So if you listen to what they say, that's for everybody, by the way, too. You remember sticks and stones are going to break my bones, name lever army kind of a thing. It's the same concept here. It's I always focus on what people do, not what they say. So they may say they're looking back at six months. I think your point's spot on. People care about right now and then right now, right? What is eternity? It's a series of never ending present series moments, of right? right now. Yeah, yeah, it's right now. It's just continued. And then right now. So the most important power, the power of now is a great book. The most important moment in anyone's life is right now. So most people get stuck in the past or, you know, worry about the future and they get away from the now, but the the secret, one of the secrets is focus on the now. So the, what, how do you do that? I believe the Fed, and I know as a market participant and, and major institutional clients, and, and I work with a lot of investors, they look at market data. And that's why for me, price is king, you know, price is primary, everything else is secondary. You can look at inflation when the CPI comes out in a month from now, or you can look at food and energy prices right now and then do your own homework and say, oh, OK, well, crude oil is up in the last three weeks. Same with soybeans, same with corn, same with wheat. What do you think is going to happen to CPI next time it gets supported? Well, clearly it's going to be up or vice versa. So that's what I do. I'm looking at markets. I always like to say the market is speaking and then ask, are you listening? Our job as market participants is to listen to the market. Put your ego, leave it at the door. This is no place for an arrogant, you know, humble humility wins on Wall Street because it's really important to put your own bias, cognitive biases and ego aside and focus on what the market is telling you. And then be fluid enough and flexible enough to adjust when the market tells you something that you're wrong or that something's not working or something's not going your way. So, you know, for now, the, the Fed knows that, it needs prices to go down. Well, a lot of the, one of the things I'm seeing in 2023 so far, and granted we're only a few weeks into it, mm-hmm. is a lot of the big trends we saw create in 2022 are now reversing. So if you look at 2022, some of the big themes in the market, you had the dollar up most of the year. Guess what? Dollars down last few months, or at least in 2023. Uh, stocks were down most of last year. They're up this year. Crypto down most of last year, up this year bond yield, so on and so forth. So a lot of the big trends we saw in 2022 are reversing now. Will they continue or will they fail? You know, this is just a little counter trend rally, if you will. We don't know yet. However, what we do know is you you have a lot of money flowing into risk on assets, like overseas markets. You know what the strongest stock market in the world is right now, or one of the strongest? Turkey. TUR is an ETF that tracks Turkey. You can look at Greece. G-R-E-K is another ETF, US-based ETF that tracks Greece. Uh, Argentina. You can look at overseas markets. EEM, which is a common ETF that tracks uh, emerging markets. Ripping. I mean, going through the China, FXI, through the roof. I think the FTSE 100 is an all-time high. So, you know, you're looking at, and they're all in bull markets. So how can you have global equity markets? And these are big, not just some like Zimbabwe stock market, no one, no one cares about, but multiple. I mean, Germany's in an uptrend, you know, France is an uptrend, so on and so forth, off of their lows from last year. It le- and they bo- they all topped out before we topped out. And if they're bottoming before we bottom, that could be bullish for 2023. So, you know, an idea with that as well is as we're moving forward into 2023. Should people, because the U.S. economy was a really big focus last year with things. Do you think emerging markets may be the next ticket overall for people to keep an eye on? Something for them to really start to look at, okay, do I want to see an expansion in the Indian markets, in the NICA? Do I want to see movement in over et cetera? So should we start looking at, at global markets more than 
staying so focused within the U.S. market? Well, that's a great question. To me, I'm looking at everything that matters, right? So I'm not going to look at some small, like Zimbabwe stock market. I'm never going to trade it, yeah. not going to touch it. However, I like liquidity. So if you've got a situation where a country has liquid investable assets, that has my attention. So India, China, emerging markets, the BRICS, like they used to say, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, and China, how any of those countries, even frontier markets, are are attractive now and and looking good. And all of these have ETFs and or ADRs that trade in the U.S. And that's where I'm primarily focused on in the U.S. Because to me, if we can't, you know, if you can't make money trading U.S. based products, yeah, good luck trading overseas stuff. Yeah. So between <laughs> Global macro from stocks, bonds, currencies, commodities, and it, if you want crypto as well too, you've got more than enough opportunity here in the U.S. than you possibly know what to do with. The key is, is to narrow that down and find an approach that works for you. One of my other you know, famous sayings is that I like to say people, there's an infinite number of ways for you to make money on Wall Street. Your job is to find one that works for you. And that's it. I mean, that's literally all we have to do. It's easier said than done. However, once you do find something that works for you, you can run with it until the cows come home. And what works for me is focusing on leadership. So to answer your question, if one of these emerging markets or frontier markets all of a sudden shows up at the top of my screens as leadership, because I scan for leadership every single week, I can share my screen here and show it to you, um, findleadingstocks.com. And I share it with my members. Like, for example, here's a... Uh, let me show you one second. This is an ETF for Egypt. Let me show you Turkey. I go through all of these. Here's Turkey. Look at that move. They bottomed at 17. And this was back in July. You then just hit 38 just recently. Pulled back into the 50, found support, and just ripped higher. So that that's in a massive, massive bull market. Let me go to favorites or uh, one second here. Country ETFs. There we go. And we can do this. Here we go. All right, Turkey. Then you go Argentina. This bottomed in July at 23 and it hit 40. I mean, that, that's a Argentina stock market has doubled just about, right? 20 up from 20 to 40, figure 23 to right around almost doubled, right? Next, Mexico. Mexico's benefited so much from this whole reshoring thing and getting away from China, moving back here. Well, all right, 43 to 60 almost. Right, that's really strong. Now, would I buy it up here? No, it's super extended. It just went from fifty to fifty-seven. It's a big move for a major global for a stock market. It's not like this is a tech stock. If it was a tech stock, it goes from fifty to fifty-seven. I'm not going to buy it at fifty-seven. I wait for a digestion or a pullback. So here's Greece. Uh, we spoke about this before. Twenty to thirty, almost thirty. Right, really strong. Italy. This thing goes from twenty-one more or less to to about thirty. That's a fifty percent move. Right, that's a big move. Thailand goes from sixty-two to eighty, huge move, and you can go on and on and on. So if if the market, our stock market, this is France, this is Germany, you can go on and on and on and do this, or, or you could just you know you go to findleadingstocks.com. I do this every weekend and go through the leaders for you. I just want to find leadership. To me, I'm agnostic. I don't. I, it doesn't matter if it's a tech stock, if it's a Chinese stock, if it's a you know a fertilizer stock, a solar power stock, it doesn't matter. I just want to know what are the strongest stocks in the market, period. What are the strongest groups in the market, period. And then once I know that, I can focus on the strongest groups, find the strongest stocks in those strongest groups, just like in sports. Creed, you like any sports? Basketball, football, soccer? Yeah, the usuals overall. Nice to watch, you know, Friday, Saturdays. Great. So if I would ask you, what's your favorite team? in the season, you would know whether your team is number one or not, right? Or you could list the top, the strongest team in the market in, in your sports league, right? All right. Well, guess what? What's the strongest stock in the market? Last year in 2022, what was the strongest stock in the market? I would challenge your audience. I speak professionally to investors all over the, the world, <laughs> now through Zoom, institutional investors, retail investors, with liquid, not penny stocks. I don't touch anything below five bucks. I don't touch penny stocks. Yeah. Liquid institutional quality stocks. This is the strongest stock in the market in 2022. NINE. Most people wouldn't have even known that. They would have said something else. Or they would have said, I just don't know. My job is to make sure I'm always laser focused and members as well on the strongest stocks in the market so I can catch something. 
I didn't buy this, by the way. It was at two bucks. Okay, below five. But once it got above five, it got my attention. Breaking from 11 to 15, good move. Some pullbacks along the way, but I just want to know the strength, no leadership. So if the markets are breaking out, hitting highs, guess what? That tells me now in global markets are doing that, that risk on, risk appetite is coming back to equities. And that for now is a good thing. So when it comes to risk on, we'll call it the, the M1 of the volatility itself, you know, combine those two right there. Do you think it's a time duration overall? Because when I've been talking with some of my clients and putting things together, we're all pretty much waiting on the Fed to, all right, get that little bit of a jitter out because it's not that much time until right. that decision, so to say here. And then we'll start to see an overarching trend within the market. Do you think that's a valid way for investors and traders within the market to go, you know what, let me keep quarter size, half size, or maybe no participation until we see that decision and then let the rest of my year play itself out? How do you feel about that kind of an idea? Yeah, I, I love that idea. For me, I'm more of a price-based trader and investor. I allocate based on market prices not based on the Fed or based on economic data. So for me, I lean very heavily into what the market's actually doing. And then my job, like a scientist, you have a scientist, um, think about the scientific method, right? You have a hypothesis, you test the hypothesis. It either works or it doesn't work or it fails. Mm -hmm. All right, same thing with me. I have an hypothesis. Will the market go up or down? It's all it can do or go sideways. For me to make money, yeah. I don't make money if it goes sideways. I make money if it goes up, if I'm long or down, if I'm short. So I have a hypothesis, I test it. If the market rewards me, means I make money, then I'll I'll allocate some more money and then some more money. As long as I'm being rewarded, I'll continue to allocate. If the market does not reward me, my hypothesis is flawed, I'm bullish and the market's bearish or vice versa, then guess what? I get out of the way. So for me, I'm very much of a price-based trader and investor, and I allocate based on what the market's actually doing. Because the market, like you can look at Turkey, for example, I again, did not buy this. However, it went from 17 to about 40. And you could have waited for some economic data to come out. It probably would have came out or still waiting and you would have missed a massive, massive move. So for me, I'm very much of a follow the market kind of an investor, not anything else. Because what shows up creating in your statement and all of our the listeners' statements? Price, the difference between your entry price and your exit price. The Fed doesn't show up on your statements. The volume doesn't show up on your state. Earnings don't show up on your statements. Fill in the blank with anything else. All that shows up is price. <laughs> so for me, I, we were talking about this before we started recording, right? The rule of one. I just yep. want, I, we were talking about multiple screens on your screen and all that. What I do now is on my screen, no more multiple tabs, no more multiple windows. I've got one tab open and that's it. When I'm done with it, I close it. I want to, my subconscious mind wants to open up multiple tabs and look at this, look at that. Blah, blah, blah. It's just too, TMI and then it becomes just lost and it, it becomes a blur. I know I can focus on one thing at one time and all of us can. The mind it can switch back and forth real fast, but single tasking is much more powerful for focus and concentration than multitasking. If you don't believe me, just take your two fingers and put them on your knees, on one on your right knee, one on your left knee and see which one you can feel. You can switch back and forth, but you can't feel both at the same time. So you can go like this and then like that. So it, it's a really cool experiment if you want to try it. So <laughs> I love it. I love it's it. very powerful. But anyway, that, we, that's that's that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Adam, you dropped a lot of great knowledge today on this. If uh, people want to find out more about not only what you're seeing in the market, but how you're approaching these different dynamics as we're moving forward in the coming months, how can they get a hold of you and how can they figure out what you got going on? Yeah, sure. I've got a podcast, which is free. It's called the Smart Money Circle. You can go on YouTube and type it in. And my goal is to, I mean, here's some of the seasons. I interview CEOs and large money managers for timeless investing advice. I had the CEO of build bear on, the CEO of uh, Zebra Holdings, the CEO of Playboy, and hundreds of, actually over $400 billion of AUM have come on the show. Jim O'Shaughnessy, famous investor. Um, the man, Leo Melamed came on, who literally, this is the man who invented stock market futures, currency futures, and treasury futures at the CME back in the uh, 70s and 80s. Uh, just next level genius. I just want to learn. So you can go to smartmoneycircle.com and you can buy my book on Amazon was number one. This is called Psychological Analysis. I was being interviewed at the NASDAQ talking about it. Here's some famous people gave me some shout outs. Or you can go to, to uh, findleadingstocks.com and take a free trial. You've got three months free 
And if you like it, stay. If you don't like it, you don't stay. And it's that simple. So it's findleadingstocks.com. I love it. I love it. All righty, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have the relevant links in the description below. Adam, I want to sincerely thank you for dropping some great knowledge and helping people, you know, just across the board, learn how to work through these things in a realistic manner. You know, I think that's the number one thing is making sure people drink from a good well of knowledge coming through. But with that being said, I look forward to having a discussion with you on the next one here. And uh, we'll definitely see how these markets react over the next coming weeks. So I love it. And thank you again for uh, dropping some great knowledge. Thanks, Creed, for having me on. Speak to you soon.